Our uh, topics for today are um, attachment behavior, which obviously is very important in terms of our understanding of parenting, and um, a second topic, uh, again, we're still in this whole area of developmental psychology, is um, you know some emerging areas of research um, on adolescent development that I think are particularly in, uh, interesting in light of uh, how much this work is helping us to, uh, to change um, our, uh, our perspective on certain social policies and development of social policies. So let's begin to um, explore uh, this. Uh, I want to talk about a pioneering psychologist, uh, actually a primatologist by the name of Harry Harlow, who performed um, some of the most interesting and at times controversial research uh, in the area of the study of attachment uh, behavior. So his story is really an interesting one because it's another example of um, this, this whole concept, uh, this whole idea of uh, serendipity and how important you know, accidental discovery uh, is in science and certainly uh, important in the area of psychology. We've taken a look at a number of cases uh, of this. So let me tell you a little bit about Harry Harlow. Um, Harry Harlow was first interested in, in studying learning and in particular, uh, this whole idea of what's called learning set theory, which is something you'll learn about uh, if you take an advanced course uh, uh, in the area of learning. Uh, and um, what it was all about was uh, learning set theory is the ability of, uh, of an animal to solve uh, a particular problem and then apply what they've just learned in solving that, a prob that problem to a more difficult problem. So it really deals with, with higher order reasoning and thinking, um, and he was doing this work in infrahuman uh, uh, primates. And um, as part of the work that they conducted, um, they um, uh, were utilizing uh, animals that had been captured uh, in various parts of the world, in places like uh, South um, uh, Africa, places like India, certain parts of Southeast Asia, these animals were trapped and they were brought to um, his laboratory, uh, uh, his, uh, the primate center at the University of Wisconsin. And uh, he and his, his, uh, his wife um, um, uh, were, again, interested in the study of learning and they perform various brain lesions on the animals and uh, on these primates in order to explore, you know, what parts of the brain are involved in learning and memory. And, and the work was incredibly expensive. Uh, it was, uh, uh, the primary expense was that of, of um, uh, having the animals trapped and then transported and brought uh, to his laboratory uh, in the United States. Uh, so uh, he and his wife started thinking about ways in which they could probably uh, cut down on their expenses. And one of the things that they thought about doing was, you know, establishing uh, what is called a breeding colony, where the, the animals, instead of being transported, are animals that instead would, would be bred right there at the laboratory. So uh, they would have, you know, a supply of animals uh, to, uh, to be used without having to trap animals uh, from foreign countries and then get involved in that whole uh, expensive uh, process, which actually became more and more difficult as well uh, to do because of certain bureaucratic changes in the tra transport of animals uh, between different countries. So. Um, again, this is uh, something that they arrived at, and uh, so they established a breeding colony of chimpanzees at Wisconsin, <clears throat> primarily to reduce the, uh, the costs of, of the animals that were involved uh, in their work. And one of the things that they found was um, that oftentimes when uh, a mother became pregnant, a female became pregnant, and then delivered her offspring, um, that uh, there would be various um, contagious diseases that would pass between the mother uh, and um, uh, the infant, uh, typically within just a few days, uh, that oftentimes would 
lead to the, the death of the infant. So they thought, well, maybe one of the things that we could do is separate the infants away from their mothers <clears throat> and uh, do it right at the time of birth. Uh, uh, so therefore, um, you know, in large part preventing uh, the transfer of, of uh, diseases. Uh, and uh, what they would do is they would take the infant away uh, from its mother uh, right after the infant was born. They'd put it into a separate cage and um, they would um, um, take a, um, I guess what you would call a baby, what looked like a baby blanket. It was actually a cheesecloth diaper uh, that they put uh, into the cage uh, of the animal and uh, of the infant. And they would hand rear these infants, give them a baby bottle and so on, have this uh, cheesecloth diaper uh, placed in the cage. And one of the problems that they were having with this was that whenever they tried to take that, um, that baby blanket, that cheesecloth diaper away from the infant, uh, they would become very agitated and distressed by it uh, to a point where uh, you know, they, they wouldn't want to give it up. And indeed, when it was taken away, um, they would be, they would almost look as though they were depressed. Uh, again, after going through a lot of agitation, then ultimately they would, uh, you know, look uh, very distressed and, and depressed uh, if, a, if a new one was not placed uh, in the cage. So they had become very attached to it. And once seeing this, Harlow and his wife uh, believed that this was a very interesting phenomenon and that it was one that they uh, thought would be very interesting to study and uh, might help us to understand the nature of uh, mother-infant interactions and attachment behavior and uh, disruptions in attachment behavior. So again, they raise these infants in isolation with this baby blanket that they become very, very uh, attached to. And again, the infants show this profound distress when the blanket was removed. And now Harlow and his wife say, well, this is so interesting. We think that we're, we're gonna study this. And in fact, they never went back to this uh, whole area of looking at uh, uh, learning set theory and the brain mechanisms that were involved in it. So to understand their research, we need to take a look uh, at, first of all, what Harlow and his wife explored. They called it the five types of love. That's the love that an infant shows for its mother, uh, the love for uh, uh, peers, uh, you know, individuals of one's own age, called it peer love, uh, the love for members of the opposite sex, we call that heterosexual love, uh, the love a mother shows for its infants, motherly love, and lastly, and something that we still don't really know all that much about, the love a father shows for its infants, uh, uh, what we would call paternal love. So <clears throat> this was what Harlow and his wife were primarily interested in exploring and studying in their laboratory at the Wisconsin Regional Primate Center, which they did for, for uh, many years. So Harlow's research on love and attachment <clears throat> in uh, chimpanzees is uh, known worldwide. It's, uh, you know, certainly written up in most um, survey courses in psychology and textbooks. And it's, it's research that uh, has been, I think, very helpful in terms of understanding, helping us understand the nature of love um, and attachment. So what Harlow and his research team do is they construct these, what, the, what they called surrogate uh, mothers. What you see here uh, in this picture are uh, two surrogate mothers. Uh, this is called the, uh, uh, the wire mother uh, that you see here constructed out of uh, regular chicken wire. This is uh, I guess what you would call the abdomen of the mother and the you know a head has been placed uh, on the top. Uh, and here's another mother. Uh, this is called the, uh, the standard cloth mother, constructed in the same way uh, with this uh, chicken wire, but then this uh, very soft uh, terry cloth uh, placed uh, on the uh, abdominal area of the mother. And what Harlow can do in this situation um, 
He can place a little heating device uh, inside the abdominal area, and uh, he does in the wire mother as well as in the, uh, uh, the cloth mother. Uh, what he can also do is uh, he can place a baby bottle uh, inside here uh, and inside here. And what he's going to do is he's going to take uh, an infant that's just been separated from its real mother, its biological mother, and place it into a cage that has these two mothers in it, the wire mother and the, uh, 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 the wire surrogate mother and the, uh, the, the cloth mother. And uh, what he's going to do is he's going to look to see what the infant does. How much time do they spend on this cloth mother? How much time do they spend on the wire mother? Uh, and sometimes the wire mother is going to be warm and sometimes the cloth mother is going to be warm because he has that little heating device inside. Sometimes the, the cloth mother is going to give milk and other times the, the wire mother is going to give milk. And what uh, Harlow is going to do is he's going to explore how much time the infant spends, you know, um, on the, in these various conditions um, uh, on the wire mother and, and uh, on the cloth mother. And uh, the results um, of, of this experiment are indeed uh, fascinating. Uh, during the first few weeks of life, the infant spends almost all of its time on the mother that's warm. So in other words, if the wire mother was warm, then that's where the infant would go. If the cloth mother was warm, that's where the infant would go. It didn't really matter which mother was giving milk. They always wanted to be on the mother, uh, the mother's ab abdomen uh, that was warm. So again, wire mother warm, then that's where the infant goes. Cloth mother warm, then that's where the infant goes. So again, warmth is the most crucial stimulus for the first few weeks uh, of life. After the first few weeks of life, what happens is the infant gravitates towards the cloth mother. It uh, doesn't matter which mother's warm, doesn't matter which mother's giving milk, they spend their time on the cloth mother. And what they do is they rub up and down the abdominal area. They rub their abdomen up and down the abdominal area of the cloth mother. Uh, and that's what infants do in the wild uh, when they're being carried by their mother. They typically will spend a lot of time rubbing up and down uh, the abdomen of the mother. And this is something that Harlow referred to as contact uh, comfort. So you can see here that uh, even though the wire mother is giving milk, uh, the cloth mother is the, you know, the base uh, for the for the uh, developing infant. They don't want to go away from this uh, mother. They want to stay clinging to her as much as possible. Um, you know, she's not giving any milk, but this wire mother is, so they just reach over and get milk, but then they return right away and stay on, on that cloth mother. Uh, Harlow also devised some very interesting uh, variations of this, for example, when uh, he placed a, a very frightening stimulus, in this case a Mickey Mouse doll that was playing a drum and was playing loud music. And uh, the infant, once the infant saw this, the infant ran away and uh, it was clinging to the cloth mother. Uh, so again, the, now the infant is beginning to see the the mother as a source of support and as a source of defense. So Harlow's essential ingredients for love and attachment. Again, what he finds is warmth, first two weeks of life, that's the critical stimulus. Um, after this, it's contact comfort. Again, after the first two weeks of life, the infant wants to be in close contact uh, with its mother and again rubbing up and down the abdomen, abdomen of the mother. This is critical for uh, attachment to take place. And what is developing is trust. Uh, there's this bond that is developed between the mother and its infant. It's being solidified. The infant comes to know that its mother is going to be there and it's going to be there for comfort and it's going to be there for uh, defense. Uh, so, um, indeed, this is, you know, very interesting uh, work, very interesting findings in terms of helping us understand uh, attachment.
variations of this, Harlow does another experiment in which he creates what he calls monster mothers. And uh, what he does in this is uh, he creates a, a surrogate mother that he calls the air blast mother. And what he does is he places down inside the abdomen um, of the uh, of the surrogate mother um, these uh, air jets that could be activated with a switch. So in other words, once um, uh, the infant uh, is uh, attached uh, to the mother and clinging to the abdomen, what Harlow can do is activate a switch that will cause these very rapid air blasts to come out from the abdominal area of the surrogate mother and strike the, the, uh, the infant's uh, abdomen. So he's exploring what happens when there's this disruption uh, that occurs. And, you know, will the infants go back to the mother uh, or not after they've experienced this? Another uh, monster mother was that of a violent shaking mother where the uh, once attachment had taken place, um, the surrogate mother, uh, Harlow could activate a switch that would cause this violent shaking uh, of the surrogate mother back and forth. Um, uh, another monster mother was what he called the catapult mother. Uh, again, once attachment had taken place, he can activate a switch that will cause the abdomen of the mother to rapidly catapult uh, the infant uh, away from, from the mother. Uh, yet another monster mother that was created was the spike mother. Um, what he did, what Harlow did was to insert these uh, three inch long spikes into the abdomen. Uh, of the surrogate mother and he could activate a switch once attachment had taken place and these spikes would come out um, away from the abdomen of the mother and actually begin to strike uh, and pierce uh, the abdominal area of the infant. Uh, and lastly, they created something called the cold mother in which they took this plastic tubing and wound it all around the abdomen uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the surrogate. And um, what Harlow could do is to activate a switch once uh, attachment had taken place where the infant was attached to this uh, surrogate mother and it would cause ice cold water to go through uh, this tubing like the, uh, like the, you know, the, the veins, uh, if you will, uh, of an individual. It's in this ice cold water. So he explores what happens and certainly in each one of these conditions there was disruption. Uh, where the infant for a period of time would stay away from the, from the mother. But in each case, with the exception of one, the infants would go back. And the only one that produced long-lasting re uh, rejection was the, was the cold mother. Uh, so indeed, this shows what, uh, what happens. Uh, essentially, a mother can do no wrong. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to disrupt this attachment. And we've learned so much about um, child abuse um, uh, from these experiments where even abused child, uh, an abused child will remain very attached uh, uh, to their mother, even though they may be emotionally and physically abused. So indeed, these are interesting experiments that have some very um, important parallels uh, to human behavior. Um, Harlow asks, also asks, what are the effects of prolonged social deprivation? Uh, Harlow um, uh, took animals uh, and deprived them uh, for significant periods of time of any kind of uh, social um, uh, interaction with peers. They, they were isolated from peers from a very early age. And it produced some, some very interesting uh, effects. Um, sexual behavior was disrupted uh, in both males and females. Uh, reduced aggressive behavior on the part of males. Uh, males uh, ordinarily uh, engage in a lot of fighting behavior in order to establish uh, dominance uh, subordinate uh, relationships. Um, and many of these males uh, uh, simply showed little or no uh, aggression at all after having been deprived uh, of uh, social uh, experience uh, for extended periods of times. And some of them even showed very uh, severe depression-like symptoms that were, were comparable to what we refer to as anaclytic depression. Uh, that is a very severe depression that we see in humans. And indeed, here you see, uh, this is an, a normal uh, a monkey that you see here. Here is a depressed monkey who simply 
you know, simply cowering in the corner of a cage with its head down. So, uh, you know, these were uh, very interesting experiments, uh, ones that, uh, you know, have helped us to understand about the importance of, you know, social contact and interaction with peers, how it uh, is so important in terms of, of uh, social behavior. Um, so, an interesting offshoot of this uh, experiments that were done by Harlow, um, in which he explored, well, you know, what happens to uh, females um, that were uh, socially deprived during development? What happens when they ultimately become pregnant after exposure to a male? And um, uh, uh, what happens in terms of their uh, behavior towards their offspring? Once socially deprived um, females became pregnant, gave birth to their own offspring, many of them became monster mothers and they engaged in a behavior that we refer to as infanticide, the killing uh, and then the eating of their own offspring. Um, interestingly, many of these uh, mothers were simply very clumsy. They would, they would uh, accidentally step uh, on their child and uh, break their skull and kill them. But others, you know, actively exhibited this uh, infanticidal uh, behavior. Now, importantly, what uh, Harlow found was that on future pregnancies, many of the females reverted back to being uh, maternal. Uh, so that's the good news uh, in, these uh, in these experiments, where after a period of uh, social interaction, it seemed like this, you know, was helpful in terms of uh, altering their behavior, uh, their maternal behavior on future pregnancies. Um, Harlow, um, you know, his work and the implications of his work, uh, this was coming at a time in which uh, the whole area of uh, child abuse was, uh, was something that was in the closet. Uh, it was going on, but no one really wanted to talk about it. No one really wanted to address it. But increasingly, uh, since the time of Harlow, researchers are finding out an awful lot about uh, social deprivation, for example, and being socially isolated. Uh, and one of the recurring findings is that parents of abused children uh, uh, oftentimes reported that they were socially isolated during their early upbringing. So, you know, this is important work that has implications for, uh, for, for humans, very strong implications. So, Isolation, so, social deprivation may be a really a key ingredient in terms of understanding, you know, instances of, of human child abuse. So the work of Harlow then is uh, incredibly important in terms of the field of developmental psychology and understanding uh, attachment um, and attachment behavior. Um, I want to now move on and spend just a little bit of time talking about adolescent uh, behavior. Uh, because this is a really an emerging area of, of uh, research. You know, scientists have shown a renewed interest uh, in this uh, in terms of what's happening behaviorally and what's happening biologically. Um, and uh, there are a number of uh, neural changes, anatomical changes that uh, we didn't realize were occurring until maybe the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, and they are really associated with some profound changes that occur in terms of emotion, in terms of mood, and uh, in terms of sleep. Uh, and lastly, um, this work has, has um, extraordinary implications for social policies and for uh, education in general. So I wanted to make sure, you know, as we as we leave this whole area, the study of development, that we did talk about um, this work at least a little bit. Um, so what do we know about adolescent behavior? Well, here's some of the main things that we know. Um, first of all, uh, what we would call, you know, uh, labile emotions. And essentially what that means is that adolescents do engage in these mood shifts. And some of those changes are ones that are related to changes that are occurring in biology. Um, I think very well known, certainly the, the case of um, adolescence and puberty and the changes that are occurring in the female in terms of hormones, changes that are occurring in the male in terms of hormones. So it, this is something that has been known for uh, quite, a, quite a extended period of time. 
Secondly, um, I think, you know, many adolescents, I think it's acknowledged by many uh, developmental psychologists, they're trying to figure out things. They're trying to figure out where they fit in, where they fit in in terms of peer groups. And uh, there's an identity crisis that, that is going on um, in, in a lot of uh, adolescents during this period of time. A third key um, uh, piece of knowledge uh, is, uh, you know, what happens in terms of peer relationships. Um, oftentimes, those peer relationships become dominant. Um, family relationships, uh, sadly, um, become uh, a second priority. Um, it's those <laughs> peer relationships that become critical. Um, another area of study has to do with uh, risk-taking, and adolescence is known for risk-taking, for testing boundaries, for being independent. So again, this is another important aspect of adolescent <coughs> behavior and study of adolescent behavior. And then lastly, um, this egocentrism uh, that occurs, and in some cases, lack of empathy, you know, this self-centered kind of attitude. So these are some of the relatively well-known findings that have to do with um, adolescent behavior. So I ask this very interesting question oftentimes when I'm lecturing on this. I say, why do most 16-year-olds drive like they're missing part of their brain? And the kind of responses that I get are, are, are very interesting. But the truth of it is, is it's the, they are missing part of their brain. One of the things that we know is the brain of an adolescent is not fully developed. And that lack of development is occurring in some of the key areas of the brain that are involved in emotion and the regulation of emotion, as you will see in some of the experiments that I described uh, to you. So when we take a look at the, the development of the brain, early development, this is from three weeks of age to the time of birth. Uh, here you can see the formation of the forebrain, the midbrain, here's the hindbrain, spinal cord, this is at three weeks. At seven weeks, again, look at the, how the forebrain is enlarging. Again, here's the midbrain, the hindbrain, you're getting development of the cranial nerves during this period of time, and the spinal cord. At 11 weeks of age, uh, again, look at how the forebrain is enlarging. Uh, here's the midbrain, uh, here's the hindbrain that you see here, cranial nerves and the spinal cord. And um, at birth, uh, here is what the forebrain looks like. Uh, here's the cerebellum, here's the medulla, here's the spinal cord, the midbrain. Uh, you, it's hidden, you can't really see it. Uh, so. This is what brain development looks like. And if you take a look at just the size of the brain, at birth, it's about 350 grams. Uh, first, uh, after the first year of life, it's about 1,000 grams. And in adulthood, it's about 1,200 to 1,400 grams. There's tremendous growth that's occurring between year one and uh, adulthood. And again, a lot of very interesting changes that are occurring uh, during adolescence. This researcher, Jay Gee, <clears throat> um, really at the forefront of uh, these recent discoveries uh, about um, uh, changes that are occurring in the adolescent brain. Uh, and there's a lot of what we call cell proliferation, that is um, the growth of new cells that's occurring uh, in a number of key areas, certainly in the cortex and the prefrontal cortical area that you see right here. Uh, there's a thickening uh, that's occurring as well, um, a thickening of gray matter. <clears throat> this is something that specifically is occurring uh, in the case of, of the adolescent during this period of time. If we um, take a look at research that was done by Deborah uh, Yergel and Todd, um, very interesting MRI work uh, that she has conducted. Um, and, you know, she's imaging the brain, and she's imaging the brain of uh, both adolescents and adults. And she's uh, <clears throat> looking at what's happening in the brain in response to how adults and how adolescents process information. And they process information in a very different way. 
if you were shown um, uh, these pictures um, and you are an adult uh, or you are an adolescent, um, uh, she asks, uh, how, how do you interpret uh, what you see? And indeed, what adults typically see here is fear. And what adolescents typically see is anger. Okay, So they're responding to the same pictures uh, to these same faces in terms of the emotion that's being expressed in dramatically different ways. Okay, So she takes a look at what's happening in the brain uh, by way of MRIs. She's exploring what's happening, you know, uh, what's the pattern of neural activation that occurs in these uh, in infants and, uh, excuse me, in adolescents and in adults when they're shown these pictures. And um, uh, an adolescent brain is responding more in the emotional part of the brain. That's this area that you see right here. That's the amygdala. Okay. You get some activation that's occurring in the smart part of the brain. Okay. In the, this prefrontal cortical area. Okay. Now let's see what happens in an adult brain. In an adult brain, you get a lot of activation in the smart part of the brain. Okay, prefrontal cortex, and not anywhere near as much activation in the uh, amygdala. So again, you're getting these different patterns of, of uh, neural changes that are occurring in response to the same stimulus, right? You're, you're getting different behaviors and you're getting different patterns of neural responses. So adult brains are using the smart part of their brain more and um, adolescents are using the more primitive uh, emotional part of the brain, the amygdala. Okay. So again, interesting differences between the two. Um, another researcher at Brown University, Mary Karskadden, uh, has been very much involved in taking a look at adolescents um, and uh, their patterns of sleep. And she believes that, that many adolescents actually have sleep disorders, uh, that they're not getting enough sleep. And, you know, she says they're not filling up their tank at night. They start the day on empty. And everything is being changed in terms of their mood, in terms of their ability really to learn, to think and react. And her conclusion is um, that they, adolescents should be at home sleeping in the morning and they should not be in class. And that has very important implications, as we will see um, in, in just couple of minutes. Here's another very interesting piece of research done by Carlisle Smith uh, in which he has been taking a look at what happens in adolescents that get poor sleep. And those individuals who sleep well do very good in terms of their performance on what's called declarative memory, you know, memorization and procedural memory that's actually solving problems. Um, but um, those individuals who do not sleep well and do not get enough sleep, um, they're at a deficit of about 30 percent. That is um, uh, their, their ability to engage in declarative memory and procedural memory is, is, is greatly impaired if they're not getting enough sleep. So this research then um, combined with some of the other research that we've talked about has uh, certain policymakers, uh, for example, like this woman that you see here, Kayla Wallstrom, uh, at the University of Minnesota, to propose um, that uh, the, the start of the school day should start later, uh, 9 a.m. instead of 7 or 7.30, as it is in, in many school districts. And it's very controversial. Um, uh, certainly, there may be these benefits of, uh, of adolescents getting more sleep, but certainly, you know, altering the school day and what that does to families and how it could be very disruptive to, to families, um, uh, could be disruptive to after school activities, could be disruptive to athletics and, and so on, um, but more and more. Uh, school districts throughout the United States are going to a later start for adolescents, and I can vouch for that. And uh, the capital region area here, many of the suburban schools now have either gone to this or are will be going to it uh, in the very near future.
So our conclusions then, um, the brains of adolescents are changing and they're changing much more dramatically than we ever thought. Uh, and um, this information, you know, it's being used to change social policy. You know, is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? You know, personally, I think it's a good thing to use evidence-based science to make decisions. Um, but obviously, there are, there are implications of this uh, in terms of, um, you know, changing the school day and how that can, can impact so many other things uh, in terms of family and community, uh, jobs and, uh, you know, social interactions and so on. So, um, uh, you know, you should think about this and you should think about it in, in terms of uh, whether or not to what extent you think that it's a, a good idea. Uh, probably be something that we'll talk about in, uh, you know, one of our uh, uh, Zoom sessions. So, um, again, um, uh, this kind of brings us to a close in this whole uh, area uh, of uh, development. We'll be moving on to some other topics in our in our next lecture.